In this video, we'll find the volume of the region enclosed by the sphere given by x squared plus y squared plus z squared is equal to 1. Here's that sphere here. We're just seeing the upper hemisphere of it. And enclosed by the plane z equal to 0, that's the xy plane where the z coordinate is 0. That's the base of our surface. And there's this cylinder that I'm given in polar coordinates. It's given by r equal to 2 times sine of theta. And that's going to be Determine, determining this uh, kind of the, the vertical walls of the region that we want. So first let's familiarize ourselves with the, the picture here and, and uh, look at the uh, equations that go with each surface again. So there's the sphere. That's the top of the surface that I'm interested in. Here is the bottom of the surface. That's where the z coordinate is equal to zero. That's the xy plane. And then the walls of my surface are formed by what looks to be some sort of circular um, figure it actually is a circle given by r equal to 2 sine of theta. We'll examine that a little bit but I have uh, just an equation in polar coordinates so it's just putting restrictions on points in the xy plane it says nothing about the z coordinates so whatever profile I see in the xy plane gets extended up vertically in a cylindrical shape here and that's determining those walls of the solid that I'm interested in. So we want to find the volume of this region trapped in between those three surfaces there. We'll express that as a, as a double integral, the appropriate double integral, and then we'll actually leave the computations offline. Okay, so the way to do this is to take this region that you're interested in, project all the points that are in that region down onto the xy plane. So here's the positive x-axis, there's the positive y-axis, and I've redrawn that here. And it looks like the circle that's forming the base, which is what, would, what I would get when I project everything down, is a, a circle who is living, which is living along the y-axis, the positive y-axis. So I think that that projection should look like this circle here. Notice it's the positive y-axis, and that will be the axis that I see of, uh, that the surface is crossing. So apparently this is the curve r equal to 2 sine of theta. Let's just get a feel that it's really the right curve, or at least, at least seems reasonable. Uh, what I'm going to do is make a little uh, table here. I'm going to take theta, different values of theta, and then we'll plot r equal to 2 sine of theta and plot the corresponding point on this curve in polar coordinates. So when I take theta to be 0 and I plug it into this expression here, I get 2 times 0 will be 0, which means that when theta is equal to zero, my angle is along the x-axis, my radius is zero, and I'm starting right there at the origin. Um, now I'm going to go to theta equal to pi over two, so that's 90 degrees along the y-axis. I'm expecting to plot a point, and if I plug in 90 degrees in here, pi over two, I get two times one, I get two, which says that I really do go two units along the y-axis to get to my point. So what's happening here is as I go from zero degrees to 90 degrees, my radius is expanding out until it gets to an extent of 2 along the y-axis. Then as I increase my angle from pi over 2 to pi, I should expect that radius to contract all the way back to 0. And just checking what happens here at pi, if I take sine of pi, 2 times sine of pi will be 0 again, and I've come back to the origin and I've gone once around. So it's very important that you understand how we've parameterized this curve. When theta is equal to zero, I start, and I only have to go up to theta equal to pi before I've gone once around this circle. I don't go twice around by going to two pi that would actually traverse this circle again. It only took 180 degrees before I swept back to the origin. So the region that I'm interested in, the projection down here is this disk bounded by the circle r equal to 2 sine of theta in polar coordinates. That's telling us where we're going to integrate. We're going to integrate over that, uh, bound, that little uh, circular region there. But the next question is, what are we going to integrate? What do we integrate? And what we need to do is integrate the function that's dictating the top of my surface, because I want to integrate that over this region to get the volume that we're seeing in, in the figure. So the top of the surface is given by the sphere. There's its equation. And I'm going to solve that for z in order to figure out what the z-coordinate is, to figure out how tall it is at each point over my region of integration. So let's solve for z. Just doing that carefully. z squared is equal to that expression. And if I take uh, 
uh, this. I'm, I'm just going to take note here that, that really what I'm doing is I'm subtracting x squared plus y squared. I'm anticipating polar coordinates here, and that looks like the radius squared. So this is 4 minus r squared in polar coordinates. And then I'm going to solve for z, and of course there's two solutions here, the positive or negative square root. And because my z coordinate is positive, it must be that we're going to integrate square root of uh, 4 minus r squared, the positive square root. So that's the function we will integrate. It's already expressed in polar coordinates. The region of integration will be this region here, this, this uh, disk in the plane. And now let's set up our integral. So the volume is the double integral over that region of this function. And we're going to integrate that over that area. I'm going to write this as an iterated integral. And I'm going to use the uh, variables dr and d theta. Remember that when you convert to polar coordinates, you incur this factor of r. This is a scaling factor that takes into account that as I move further away from the pole, from the origin, areas get larger. And as I move into the pole, into the origin here, areas get smaller. So that's providing that appropriate scaling factor. Here's the function I want to integrate still. Now, uh, it is very important that we took the time to understand how we traversed around that circle there because my theta values need to go from theta equal to 0 to theta equal to pi. If you go to pi here, you'll go around the circle twice. Don't do that. Just want to consider how you're tracing out that circle and do it in a continuous fashion to go around it exactly once. 0 to pi will do the job. Once you've determined the, the uh, values for theta, now think about a typical generic angle theta and how it intersects your region. So a, a constant value of theta is some sort of ray emanating from the origin, and it enters the region of my integration right away. We're, we're immediately in the circle, and it exits it right at this boundary curve, which is given by r equal to 2 sine of theta. So my limits of integration for r will go from r equal to 0 to r equal to 2 sine of theta. And now we've set up our integral here, and it's now a straightforward calculation to uh, find the area here. Uh, now, to be honest, it's, it's actually not so trivial. I, I'm not going to do the calculation on the video, and you can find a, a, a solution to this on Blackboard. But just uh, take note here what you might do to get started. Here I have r squared, and I have this factor of r. So you could do a substitution to get started. But there are a number of technical details and, and, and some things to consider when you do this calculation. So you should look at the handout that appears on Blackboard for some details of doing that computation. I think it's worth taking the time to do this. But for the sake of the video, we have a nice iterated in integral. You can go and put that into Wolfram Alpha or some equivalent uh, software package and get the value of that volume now.